Um, this work is, as you said, it's a collaboration between individuals at seven different uh, companies and institutions. Uh, our part at Triple Take was that we built the initial scale model holograms and the display hardware for the proof of concept um, and invented some of the, um, the key uh, optical systems and mathematical analyses which will be used uh, for a third generation hologram that'll be actually installed later this year. Um, our principal author, Stephen Hart from Holorad, is actually in New York as of as we speak um, to be installing the second generation of the hologram. Uh, we're talking today, today about a full aperture uh, transmission hologram made from multiple slices of data. Uh, it shows the distribution within local space of several thousand planets discovered by the NASA over the last year. Uh, a few of these might even be habitable. Uh, first generation version of the hologram has been installed uh, last November at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Um, so we have some press reviews on that, which is good for us all. And we had a lot of help on the project, which I will credit at the end. Um, first, we're just going to review your basic uh, uh, classical transmission holography. We start with a laser. Um, we split the beam in two, uh, expand one beam as an off-axis recording, uh, shine the reference onto the recording medium, and then meanwhile we expand the other beam and shine it onto the object of our hologram. So each point of the object scatters light towards our recording medium. And then the light from the different object points uh, all take different paths. And then one page of math later, we have recorded our hologram uh, onto the film in, with relative brightness and the absolute distance at every object point. Now we have, now we just take that same reference beam, we shine it onto our recorded reference pattern, which diffracts the light as though it came from the original object points, so that we see a reconstruction as the waveform of the light scattered from our original object. Uh, critically, because this is a classical hologram rather than a stereogram, when we look at the holographic image, it triggers all of our psychological depth cues, a combination of the retina, um, uh, I'm sorry, a combination of the, the lens of each eye, motion parallax across the retina of each eye, uh, convergence of the eyes to swivel in and something to, to look at, and the stereoscopic disparity between the images of each retina. Um, and because all of these depth cues are working together, a hologram can look stunningly realistic. But what if the object is too large, or it won't stay still, or it is too far away, or too dark? And by that, we mean that it doesn't scatter our laser light. Um, or maybe it's just data that's representative of an idea or a concept that is not embodied in physically accessible form. And that is, in our case, um, what we have is a big chunk of interstellar space is our object. So it definitely is not going to fit in our lab. In our case, the answer is that we are going to record what we call a voxgram. So in comparison to the normal transmission hologram that we showed you before, we start with the same laser beam reference and film. Oops. Sorry, sticky paper. Um, but instead of the object, we're going to use a computer-driven LCD to laser project the image data. Project it onto a diffusion screen, and from every point on the screen, the light scatters to our film, forming a hologram of whatever you choose to project on the screen. Okay. Seem to be a little out of focus here. Oh, no, I'm not. Sorry. Um, so now we have a, a hologram of a slice of data with the screen being the object. And this screen is at the point of the real physical measurable distance from, um, from the film. But we can move that screen. So the screen is moved back a little, which I already showed you moving it back a few times there. Um, it projects some, a different image data, and then we record the second hologram at the slightly greater distance. Then we, then we move it forward again for the third hologram, and again and again. And in fact, we do this tens of hundreds of times. Um, and each hologram being recorded across the entire face of the film. Aha. 
Now, when we replay the film, we see the light from every data point and every slice within the volume which our screen is swept through. And this is, in reality, what looks like on the table. Um, you can see there's your reference beam coming in here, and the screen here has a slide so that we can move that screen and project each of the individual data slices towards the film, which is hiding back there. Um, our data usually looks something like this, uh, what a lot of you are familiar with, uh, Voxel, and uh, one of the things that made this very famous was the big uh, issue where we got medical imaging and we took the CAT data dating and we've saved a lot of lives and we're very big in the media when we actually, when a hologram saved the lives of the conjoined twins because the hologram showed uh, you know, a very delicate vein just where the surgeons were about to cut. And so they changed what they were planning on doing, and the twins survived, and that was a very big moment for holography. Um, when we view it, uh, when we're done with the hologram, it gets viewed on a dispersion compensated white light display, which was originally in, uh, invented by Kaveh Bazargan. So we're still using that today. So uh, last year, an astronomer at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City was looking for a way to show some very different kind of data. NASA had launched a satellite uh, called the Kepler uh, to look at habitable planets in, the region, in, in our region of the galaxy. Um, now, Kepler stares endlessly at one small piece in the sky in the direction in the, of Cygnus. And it sees in that area about 145,000 stars most of which never do anything particularly interesting. But once in a while, it sees a very slight dimming when a planet passes in front of a star. This is just like last month's transit of Venus that you all uh, probably were watching, um, where another planet passes between the star. In this case, it was the sun and, and us here on Earth, so we saw Venus go across the sun. If this happens regularly, every, every few months, then it's, then it's easy to, to conclude that the planet's orbits a star with that period. Uh, Kepler has already found about 2,000 candidate planets, including hundreds which are Earth-sized, and about 50 which are in this so-called Goldilocks zone, where it's not too cold, so the water would freeze, and not too hot where it would boil off. It's just right, assuming, of course, that life needs water. Uh, NASA has now estimated that about 5.4% of all stars have Earth-sized planets. And in fact, there should be about 30,000 habitable planets within 3,000 light years of Earth, and about 2 billion in total in our galaxy, which is, of course, only one of many billions of galaxies. And probably within the next year, Kepler will find a nice, solid, Earth-sized habitable planet with a few thousand light years of, of ours. So we undertook to make a two-meter square hologram showing where these planets are. It turns out that's not so easy. Uh, the Kepler project published a huge amount of data, but we wanted a simple hologram that just showed those star fields in XYZ space. Now, Kepler's uh, focal plane was tiled with 42 large CCDs with huge and varying gaps between them. So first, we wrote a special program to remove the gaps. So the distribution of stars in our hologram isn't, isn't really scientifically accurate uh, because we had to kind of cushion them in to move the, the gaps but the museum wanted visitors to concentrate on the sheer density of stars without getting bogged down in technical details like that. And actually, it turns out also that Kepler doesn't measure the distances of, of its stars. So we had to estimate that using a well-known visual distance modulus equation um, in order to assume certain color temperatures. But fortunately, our team includes an astronomer. Um, and all of this is, even then, is still very approximate. So again, the holograms accurately illustrates the idea or the sense of the hologram and all the planets and the stars in their space without being entirely scientifically accurate. Um, and the distance math you see here isn't really all that complicated. Uh, the formula depends on the brightness of magnitude of each star, which Kepler does measure very accurately, because the transiting planet only blocks a small fraction of the star's light, and it depends on the, on the star's radius, which is derived very accurately from the Kepler's timing um, software, and it depends also on the star's temperature, which, to be honest, is kind of a guess based on the color which Kepler sort of was measuring. 
So the, the details of the hologram, um, it's over 40 square feet, which we think may make it the largest uh, currently installed hologram, but it's actually made up of 38 tiles or 40, 42 if you count the blank corners from Kepler's CCDs where they didn't have all the data on the corners. Uh, the stars themselves ex extend through a sweep of 26 inches or to put it another way, about 16,000 light years. So in that sense, we really think we have the world's biggest hologram. <laughs> Um, this distance axis is about 25 light years per millimeter. So when you sort of steal towards the hologram, you're moving at a scale of about 25,000 times the speed of light. So that's warp 9.9 .9 when you do your little holography dance. Um, and the front of the star field is actually about 42 inches projected uh, towards the audience. So the museum visitors can actually step into the hologram and have that experience of being among the stars. Um, having made the hologram, we also now need to provide for its replay. Um, so we used a gutted laser TV um, for the replay light source because, as you can see by the power there, that it provides quite a big bang for the, for the buck. Um, the green light is actually a custom Mitsubishi-built uh, frequency double diode pump YAG. Um, but it didn't have a lot of coherence length, so it wasn't what we actually used to record the holograms. For that, uh, we used a Verity uh, 5G from Coherent, which is a much more reliable and beautiful scientific laser. Um, the red uh, is a modified DVD burner diode, and the blue is a modified Blu-ray burner, uh, both of which Mitsubishi are experts at making. So this was a fabulous display unit, all compact. Um, the additional thing is that we managed to retain most of the TV's input and out output image formation parts um, so, that, so that we could generate a select color for a uh, way of uh, generating the multiple beams to create the, the, uh, the display, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, we retained pretty much all of the TV's input and image forming parts so that we could generate and select the color of multiple beams in our display just by feeding a pickoff meter with the DVD of pre-generated color fields. So there's no moving parts. We just had the DVD of all the colors, and that, when it went through the TV uh, engine, automatically gave us the colors that referenced the hologram. Um, this is kind of a funky slide there with many generations of our uh, equipment that we put together for it, and that in itself was a, a fun project. Um, but for the first installation, um, which, uh, for first generation, which was installed, la um, yeah, that's the one installed last November, uh, was only about half as deep as, as our, our final thing is going to be. It only had half as many stars, and it left the CCD gaps still in place. Um, and that is a single channel green hologram with a static image of the star field, and that's what's up there up until this week. Uh, the second generation is to be in place by Independence Day, um, and that's the one that I described to you a minute ago. And in this generation, uh, in addition to the star field, it can crossfade with little auraries with, of half a dozen of the most interesting planets that were found there, so that there's a little storytelling going in an interactive display. The following generation, which will be later this year, should have up to three channels for full color capability, and a fourth so that we can highlight extra content. Uh, the initial press reviews were, were actually pretty good. Um, uh, in practice, the museum's exhibits are evaluated most in, almost entirely on the New York Times review, um, and they kind of like the Star Trek inference. Uh, the Newark Star Legend uh, must have had a rubber ruler or something because they overestimated the size of our, our actual display, but that's okay. Um, and we rather liked this discussion from the hippies at the Huffington, you know, the trippy 3D. <laughs> uh, so finally, I'd like to thank um, everyone at the American Museum of Natural History and the following organizations, all of which uh, contributed some technical and financial support. Um, and I'd be happy to take some questions in as much as I can answer well the parts I was involved in and might have to defer to others for the, um, the other bits. Um, 
How long will it be on display and where can we go see it again? It's the New York Museum of Natural History. And actually, Steve Hart said that if you contact him, he's, he could try to get you a little discount on the tickets to get in there. Um, it's only one, at the, one exhibit at the end of an otherwise regular uh, admission to the, to the museum. Um, it's supposed to be on display for at least a year. And then after that, we're hoping it will even travel. But that's still undetermined. Uh, Joy, uh, th uh, thank you for your nice discussion and triple take. Um, <coughs> you have to excuse me, I'm <laughs> losing my voice. But you know, yeah, we all are. <laughs> uh, 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 early on, you, um, you when you showed that you were recording the star field and you had multiple exposures and you moved the, I guess the, the frosted sheet way. Sounds like you had quite a few uh, multiple uh, exposures on that film. How, how did could you give us any details on how you were able to do so many exposures on on, on one piece of film or whatever? Um, they are all done on one piece of foam, film, and they and they have several exposures. And in the case when I said that the reduced one had fewer pieces on it, and then we're going to fill in more. Um, but the the voxel technology that's been used for the CAT scan data has done up to 400 slices, mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things that Steve's really worked a lot of detail on over the years of how to get that many uh, recording things into one piece of film. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Okay.